I think you have probably read the note about Michael Berg in your program. Michael Berg has been a peacemaker all his life and was a high school teacher in Westchester, Pennsylvania. He has been a highly respected person in his community all his life. But when his son, Nick, was murdered in Iraq by the al Sakawi group shortly after the horrors of the battle for Fallujah, and Nick's picture with his captors were flashed around the world. Michael was overcome with grief and anger. Adding to his trials was the fact that his house and front lawn were suddenly besieged by national and international press. His anger was directed at individuals in our own government for putting his son at risk. I will let him explain his journey from anger to forgiveness and peace as he attended a course on forgiveness at Immaculata College under Sister Sheila Galligan. After his son's death, Michael went to Westchester in front of the courthouse Saturday mornings holding up a sign that said peace. For a while he was there all by himself, but soon others joined him. And a weekly peace vigil continues there to this day. The family moved to Wilmington, Delaware, and Michael immediately put his sign on the back of the house saying, War is not the answer. And although he then moved to Norfolk, Virginia to be close to his grandchildren, that sign is still there in plain sight for all the traffic that comes to Wilmington on Route 52, a main traffic artery into Wilmington. In 2005, Michael received the Adele Dyer St. Thomas of Villanova Peace Award. Currently, he lives in Virginia close to his grandchildren. I am very pleased to present to you Michael Burke. Thank you, Daniel. And thank you all for having me here, for coming coming here to be together today. Celeste, as always, has really focused on things that are vitally important. And you know, during that litany, I was thinking that I'd have to think about some of the things that I heard. But whatever we each believe about that day, September 11th, 2001, I think we can all agree that today is a day to reflect over not only the events of that day, but the events of the 10 years that have followed. To me, one of the worst things about what happened on 911 was that it was avoidable. I was teaching school that day, high school, and the students that were in the room said to me, Mr. Bird, why did they do that to us? Why did these people attack us? And I said that it was a complex thing, but that I was sure that our foreign policy of non-negotiation had something to do with it, and that they needed to look back at American foreign policy. I think had that happened, those deaths might have been avoidable and maybe the thousands and hundreds of thousands, maybe a million deaths since then. The other really terrible thing is that the events of 911 has put us at war seemingly forever after. Even those against, even those of us who are against wars our government is waging. Sometimes we, too, are at war. I know I was for a very long time, especially after my son Nick was killed 
in Iraq in 2004. Nick was 26 years old, a civilian, and he, he was at peace in Iraq. He said he was looking for work. He had started in his own radio tower construction company, and he said that he believed that if he looked long enough and if he looked hard enough, he would land a big government contract that would just make his little company. He did not get that contract. Hal Burton did, Bechtels did, Lockheed Martin did, and Nick got a coffin and a ride home in a cargo jet that landed unobserved in Dover, Delaware. Nick was at peace with lots of people in a lot of countries. He had gone on three separate trips to Africa to help out there where he could put his engineering background to good use. He went to Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, and the Maasai Reservation. Each time when he left, he left the people a little better off than when he came. He left tools, he left money, he left the business. He left the chance for a better life to those he helped. Once, he even left all of his clothing, except for what was on his back. But most of all, when Nick came back from Africa, he left a big piece of his heart there. And he could not be at peace with himself until he went back. There was so much to do. So, it was not a surprise to me when he announced that he was going to Iraq to help rebuild the ruins in which our bombs left that country. He didn't fool me about the big contract. He didn't go for the money. He never made a dime. And when he came home after his first trip again, he left his tools, supplies, and money. And again, he left his heart. Again. He was at peace in Iraq, helping. Again, when he returned home, he found it difficult to be at peace with himself. So, just six weeks after his return from Iraq, he boarded another jet plane, and that was the last I ever saw him. While on a humanitarian mission, he was arrested at a checkpoint in Mosul, a northern city, by the Iraqi police. They took him to the U.S. military police, who decided that since he wasn't military, since he did not work for Blackwater or Halliburton or Bechtels, he was suspicious. They held him illegally for 13 days. No phone call home. No lawyer. And at first he was placed with Al-Qaeda, who shouted anti-Semitic death threats to him. Finally, the FBI came to my house and told me that they had Nick. They confirmed with me that he was who he said, and they told my wife and I that they would recommend his immediate release. This was March 31st of 2004. He had had a commitment on April 2nd, which he was determined to make. He was in a close friend's wedding. By April the 5th, we still had no word from him. The release of photos of illegal torture, of rapes and murders taking place in the Abu Ghraib prison had now been released, and the war exploded. I filed a writ of habeas corpus, and Nick was released the next day. On April the 9th, Nick phoned from Baghdad. He'd be careful, but try to get home as quickly as he could. We never heard from Nick again. We tried everything to find him. The military wouldn't help. The State Department couldn't help. The FBI hung up on me. The private security firm I hired said that it was too hot, too dangerous for their operative safety. The Red Cross, though, did list his name as missing, and only two media sources out of dozens I contacted, begging them to publish that my son was missing in Iraq, an American was missing in Iraq. Only two of 
those media sources responded. And they, both after his death, only we didn't know it at the time. I got that dreaded phone call, you know the one, from the State Department on May the 10th. I knew it was coming. And on May the 11th, that awful videotape of Nick's murder was released for all the world to gawk at. That I never expected. I immediately went to war. I went to war with my son's imagined murderers. I went to war with the U.S. military and FBI for holding him in Iraq until it was unsafe for him to travel to the airplane that would bring him home to me. I went to war with the media who would not tell the public that he was missing, but who now wanted to know every detail of his life as dozens of them camped out in their vans in front of my house. And I certainly went to war with every member of the Bush administration, especially George Bush himself and Donald Rumsfeld. The media wanted a statement from me. I stood in front of my house and I said with all the venom that I had in my heart, Nick Burr died for the sins of George Bush and Donald Rumsfeld. I was even at war with my family who didn't want me to be at war with anyone. That statement about George Bush and Donald Rumsfeld got me invitations to speak on six continents. And each time I spoke, I raged war on war. Finally, I was sent a picture taken in Seoul, or maybe it was Busan in South Korea, where I had traveled to speak. In the picture, I had my arm raised and a fist above my head. I know that to some, a clenched fist means unity, but to me, it meant I was ready to fight against war. So after seeing that picture that I realized you can't rage peace. You can't. I wasn't a peace active any, activist anymore. I had lost my identity to hate and revenge. I was at war with war. I was a peace rager. I was allowing myself what I denied others. I was giving myself the right make war. I knew at that point that I was in trouble, but I didn't know how to change. Fortunately for me, the answer came in a college catalog for adults from Immaculata University near my house in Westchester, Pennsylvania. Here I learned that I must allow others what I allow myself. I learned that I should expect from others no more than I expect from myself. I learned that I too need to be forgiven. And finally, I learned forgiveness. This process of, of learning to forgive is one that has evolved and is still evolving in my mind and my heart over the past seven years of my life. My answers have constantly changed. Here at this course at Immaculata, I learned to do what I had declared I would have prevented the attack on the World Trade Center on September 11th. I learned to expect from myself what I expected from others. I learned to sit down and talk with those with whom I had a grievance. Yes, even terrorists. Yes, even George Bush himself. Eventually, I learned that you cannot be at war for peace. You are either at war or at peace. Now, the men who killed my son, Nick, were not accepting invitations from me to sit down and iron out our differences. Whereas George Bush could have met with Al-Qaeda, but chose not to, and at least learned what their grievance was, I could not. Nor did George Bush like me much. I tried every which way to get him to speak to me, but my attempts were fruitless and sometimes got me arrested. At Immaculata, though, I learned how to get around this. I learned the letter writing technique and a technique called the empty chair technique. The letters 
I sent to George Bush, though, and to Al-Qaeda, and yes, even to my son Nick and other family members, were not placed in mailboxes, but in a drawer or a folder in cyberspace. Several days later, I would retrieve them and write an answer as I posed as the recipient of my own letter and tried my very hardest to see it from their point of view. I sat, too, next to an empty chair, and in that empty chair I imagined sat Abu Musab al zarqawi the leader of the group who killed Nick and the actual knife wielder. I asked him, why did you have to use against violence against my son, against so, so many? And he replied, you know, when Nick was killed, you were 59 years old, and I suspect you had some emotional maturity, some experience with grief, the support group, all true. He went on to say, imagine that you have led a pretty peaceful life, that you were brought up in the ways of peace, also true. Imagine, he went on to say, if instead you were eight years old in 1991 when you lost every member of your family to American bombs, Imagine the hiding under a bed as green flashes illuminated their targets, including you. Imagine if you were brought up with this violence and thought that violence was the only way, might you not strap a bag of bombs to your back or fly an airplane into a building? As I learned at Immaculata, people who do awful things frequently are themselves wounded. My conversation with George Bush was even more difficult, but suffice it to say, by its end, we managed to find some ground when I agreed with him, yeah, I didn't like your father much either. Well, it was a start. Forgiveness would come after many, many repetitions of this empty chair conversation. But forgiveness would come from me. I could not forgive on anyone else's behalf, and I do not. Forgiveness, I learned, does not mean condoning the act of the person you forgive. It means forgiving the person. It means forgiving, but still holding that person accountable. It means forgiving, not forgetting. It means forgiving and restoring your relationship to the person you forgive. Maybe not to the same point where it was before, but at least to a civil, humane point. Maybe you don't go to their wedding, but maybe if they get sick, you still send them a card. And forgiveness takes time and patience. Sister Sheila Galligan, who taught the course at Immaculata on forgiveness, said, forgiving is like quitting cigarettes. Sometimes you have to do it over and over again and again. Forgiveness means not allowing yourself to be consumed by hate not allowing your identity to be usurped by anger or vengeance. I still have my bad days when I have to start over again. But I can tell you, I am no longer at war. I still do most of the anti-war activities I used to do, but I do them in peace, not in war in my heart. And I haven't been arrested lately. And there is an unexpected benefit I found. My whole life has changed. My relationships with family members have changed. My way of thinking has changed. Even my driving has changed. My heart has changed from war to peace. And I am trying to be that change which I seek. Peace is forgiveness. Forgiveness is peace. So won't you all just give peace a chance? Thank you.